Hey everyone, welcome to Microchip Livestream. My name is Matthew Dickens and I'm here with my cohort, Dr. Patrick Marcus from Marcus Engineering. And today we're going to be talking about from idea to finished product, an interview with an engineering design partner president. Uh, before we get too far into it, I'm going to take us to the back and we'll ask Ricky kind of how to get involved in the live stream, how can you guys ask questions, different things like that. Ricky? Johnson, uh, I work for Mark McComb. I'm sorry, I, I just flubbed that a little bit. You, you were muted a bit. Oh, so. well, that's hey, okay. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> I can just start let's introduce over. yourself over yeah. again. Hey, how's it going? I'm Ricky Johnson. Uh, as you might have heard before, I work for Mark McComb, who's normally the guy at the front desk. Uh, but today's my first live stream. I'm here with Wayne Freeman. How's it going, Wayne? It's going well. Today is not my first live stream, but I'm still kind of messing up. So that's that's a little. That's fun. okay. It's that's because what you're it's here. About. Yeah, yeah. I. Just wanted to mix it up. It's, a it's good bit to have here. you here. Like I, usually, I'm sitting here with, with Matt, but now he's uh, he's out there with Patrick and yeah, you know, in, in the big leagues. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do we got going on today? Uh, yeah, today. So if you want to uh, email us with any comments, concerns, or anything that you might have, feel free to email us at livestream at microchip.com. Additionally, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button as well as the bell so that you can be notified uh, in the future when we do any future live streams or anything like that. And additionally, we have this AVR IoT WG evaluation board, uh, which is a really cool really device for rapid prototyping. Uh, you can connect to the Google Cloud in 30 seconds or less with this board, and uh, it really fits the discussion that we're going to have today. Uh, anything else to add about this or anything that no, I missed? No, I'd just like to say hello to everybody who's commented so far. Uh, Jared, Cat, 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 uh, Electronics, uh, Greg. Greg, Ronnie. Um, Wilson and Geraldo. Hello. Good, hello. Good. Good morning. Good evening. Good night. Yes. <laughs> so I guess we'll throw it back to the stage and uh, let and, and let the discussion ensue. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Wayne. Well, before we get into really the nitty gritty of what we'll be talking about today, Patrick, you want to tell me a little bit about who you are, what gives you the permission to be at this booth today, <laughs> sure all that thing, kind Matt. of good stuff. So my name is Patrick Marcus. I'm the president of an engineering firm in Tucson, Arizona called Marcus Engineering. We do a lot of electronics product development for highly regulated industries. So we do a lot of medical device design, a lot of military and aerospace products, and we work with very large companies, but we also do a lot of work to help entrepreneurs. Um, my personal background actually involves a lot of due diligence for angel investors okay. and venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. Um, I help administer a $3 million grant program for entrepreneurs that the state of Arizona puts on. It's actually one of the largest programs in the state. And I also do a lot of entrepreneurial education in Tucson and Phoenix for um, programs called Startup Tucson and Founder Institute, which is actually a Silicon Valley incubator that has a franchise in Phoenix and in Tucson. Wow, so you have almost no experience with entrepreneurs. I then. don't know anything about it. This will be fun trying to make it up as we go along. Awesome. Great. Well, that's awesome. No, it sounds like you have a lot of really cool experience. It's going to bring a lot of insight into the conversation today. Um, so I'm actually working on a project right now, and I thought that maybe a good way to frame this conversation would be to let you in, and you can kind of yeah, coach me, me through the process. Yeah, tell me about it. That's exciting. All right, what do you got? cool. So I was at home the that's other day. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Tell me more. I was at home the other day and I realized that I kind of have a tendency to forget how to water my plants and keep them watered. And oh, yeah, okay. Green Thumb is not my middle name, as it were. <laughs> but, you know, you still try to grow the basil yeah. at home, all that kind of good stuff. So I was trying to think of a good way to basically ha keep the water soil wet as I was going on. Okay, yeah. And I realized there's probably other people out there that would have some similar idea. And so... Yeah, I have that problem myself. Okay, great. So how would I go about discovering if, is that just my problem or is that a viable enough of an idea to really take something and try to take it to market? You know, Matt, that's a, that's a really good question. And that kind of brings us into a really important topic area called... Um, uh, customer discovery. Okay. And uh, what people don't realize is they very often fall in love with their with their product ideas and their solution especially and they don't often take the time to really think about whether or not there's a market for their product or whether or not their customers really need it. And uh, a mistake that people often make is they'll go to their, their, their girlfriend, their wife, their grandma, right, and, right. and what happens if you ask your grandma if she likes your idea? She loves every idea. They love every idea. <laughs> you have to go to real customers 
and people who would really potentially use their product, but not ask them about your solution. You have to ask them about their pain points. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so rather than asking them what would be a great way to do something, I'm asking them what is a problem that you need solving that is something you run into kind of on a daily exactly. basis. Exactly, and there's actually a really important secret here. Okay. A really important trick. You can't go in asking them about the problem that you think they have. Like, okay. You don't want to go and say, hey, tell me about your problems watering your house plants. Gotcha. Okay. You have to talk to them more broadly about what are the problems with um, gardening and growing mm. plants in general. And, and the trick here is if your problem that you think they have isn't on their top 10 list of things that they care about, they might not ever buy your product. Because oh, wow. you can imagine, we've only got the attention span for five or 10 things sure. every day sure. and the things that we need to do in our life. And um, something may sound like a good idea. Yeah. It may sound like the right price for it. Okay. But if it's not on their top 10 list, they may never get around to making that a priority. Oh, so wow. it's really That's important when you're looking at the marketplace and looking at whether your customers really want your product to make sure to start with open ended questions and talk to them about their general pain points and see if your problem and your solution even comes up on their radar. And that's a really good litmus test for whether or not you're on the right track. Okay, cool. So taking it then to this idea that I have, I would probably want to, rather than going up to my grandma or my mom or <laughs> right. somebody like that and saying, hey, do you have a problem watering plants? I would ask something more general like, hey, what are types of issues you run into when you're gardening or do you yes, even garden? Yes, or things exactly. like that. Okay. Exactly. That's okay. exactly the right idea. Cool. Is there any... I don't know, benefit or anything like that to asking the question like, do you even garden in the first place and stuff like that? Like, to, how do I, maybe how do I figure out who the right people are to be asking those questions to? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question too. And um, initially when you're starting to do customer discovery, you want to start out very broad, but you want to at least um, enclose the problem enough so that you're even talking in the right vein. So you don't want to just go and sit down with someone and be like, hey Matt, tell me about the problems that you're having. Mm, okay. But maybe you come up to me and say, um, hey Matt, tell me, tell, do you like gardening? Okay. Well, I, I hate gardening. Okay, well, thanks for your time. <laughs> hey Matt, do you like gardening? Yes, I, li I like gardening. Um, well, tell, tell me more about that. What do you like about gardening? Okay, okay that's interesting. Okay. Um, what do you dislike about gardening? And slowly let them tell a narrative, let them tell a story. Anecdotes are very powerful okay. for picking out um, what people are really worried about and what they care about. Yeah. So get them into that mode of telling a story. Okay, get them into the mode of telling a story. I like that. That's a really cool image of kind of yeah. how to explore that customer process. Okay, great. So I've talked to some of my potential customers. Is there like a good number that I should shoot for when I am? Like how many people I should talk to or as many as I can? Or how do I know when I've asked enough people? You know, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. We could get into all kinds of uh, statistics and statistical yeah. significance, but at the end of the day, it's it's a lot of your judgment and, okay. and gut fill. Um, for commercial consumer products, I'd probably say many, many tens of, of okay. customer interviews, at least initially, and then start kind of refining your questions, uh, start getting more of a feel for the, the areas of the problem that you really need to dig further into. Okay. Uh, but you really can't have too many customer interviews, but okay. certainly 50 to 100 by the time you're done doing the interview process um, is a pretty good way to go. Now, okay. if you're doing more of a, a, a business to business type product oh, or something okay. for industrial products, yeah. where maybe you only have 10 customers that mm -hmm. you can even identify, well, maybe you can get the purchasing managers for five of them or the engineering managers oh, for five idea. of them. Okay. Um, so it really just depends on what kind of product it is. Yeah. But in general, for consumer spaces, many tens to get started, probably targeting 50 to 100 by the time you're done with interviews. And for more business to business, um, or industrial type products, uh, probably in the tens of customers, okay. but certainly the more the better. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So I've come up with this kind of initial idea. Maybe I have my napkin sketch or something yeah, right. like that. And I 
I'm able to take that and then I take that to my 100 plus customers or my 100 plus ideas since I would assume that some kind of a plant water sensor thing would probably be in the consumer space. Probably. Um, maybe, maybe there's a few industrial applications but not many that I can come up with off the top of my head but maybe that's where the customer journey Well yeah and that's, part of, that's an important part of the customer interview process. Um, let's say we're talking about your product for a minute here and you really don't know if there might be industrial applications or greenhouse applications yeah, or consumer sure, applications. Sure. You might want to say, okay, I'm going to talk to um, 20 stay-at-home moms and okay. I'm going to talk to um, 10 college students yeah. and I'm going to talk to five people that run greenhouses okay. and I'm going to try to talk to someone who work, five people who work at Monsanto yeah. and you know, figure out where the, the actual wants are and where the actual needs are, you'll be surprised at how, how often your conception of the problem yeah. and your solution actually change. Um, what you're really going for is low-hanging fruit. You low want to pluck okay. the low-hanging fruit right from the lowest branch that you can because okay. um, in entrepreneurship it's all about getting a minimum viable product which is the simplest solution possible to market and get to revenue as fast as you can. And then you have some breathing room. Okay, cool. Well, it looks like we have a question from the back. So, Ricky Great. or uh, Wayne, you want to let us know? Maybe. Hey, yeah, we have a question. Uh, this question is from Jatin. Uh, hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right. I'm sorry if I'm not. Uh, he asked, how, to, how can I connect to those people? And I wasn't quite sure what he meant by those people, but you were just talking about um, some of the customers that you might be reaching out to. I know that can be really intimidating when you're talking about uh, going to talk to a business and things like that and getting your foot in the door might be kind of hard to do. So um, maybe could you explain or elaborate a little bit about how you can uh, make that initial contact with those businesses yeah, or those customers? Especially if you are new to you know, the, the, embedded, you know, the, the embedded design world and whatnot and you right. don't necessarily have customer, a customer base you can draw from. Right. Any thoughts? Yeah, that's, that's actually a, um, a, a, a typical problem. And, and I'm just going to back up for a second and, and say that there's usually three pillars that I, I try to teach to entrepreneurs to um, help them hone in on what they really should be working on. Okay. And those three pillars are talent. You need to be good at what it is you expect to do. Otherwise, okay. it's very hard to be successful. You have to have passion. Okay. So if you're not passionate, you're usually not going to succeed because it takes right. a lot of hard work, right? Sure, sure. It's really difficult. And then the third one, which is relevant to this question, is network. Okay. It really helps to be connected to the industry and to the customer base um, that you're working in. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't um, be successful yeah. with two of the three pillars. If you've only got one, you might want to rethink what you're doing, sure. honestly. but. Um, it, it can be tricky, but it, you, you can be missing the network, but it means you got to hustle. And you have to be inventive and thoughtful about how you're going to reach those, those potential customers. But there's lots of pathways to doing it. You can create um, um, stand-up websites and okay. use Google AdWords to try to lure in potential customers, oh, collect, okay. their, collect their information, and then yeah. go and reach out to them and okay. ask them questions. That's a great um, idea. You can use LinkedIn to find industrial customers oh, and that's just, okay. just, just cool. try to connect cool. with them, try to yeah. reach out. Um, even on Facebook, you can do similar things. So, so really, uh, if you don't know how to connect to your customers and you're just not sure how to get there, but you're certain you have a really good idea, um, the truth is you got to hustle and you got to be um, outgoing and extroverted and really make an effort to reach out to those people and try to dig them up. So you're saying yeah. it's not easy. Is the point. That is correct. <laughs> it is not easy to do. Well, and I would even assume... But it is possible. Like in the, in the vein of networking, if you are somebody who's extremely technically minded yeah. and likes to just stay at home, doors closed, programming all day or something like that, but you have a really cool idea, finding somebody to partner with who kind of has those people skills, as people call them, who has that, maybe doesn't have the skill, but they have the passion. So they have two of the pillars and you have two of the pillars and you guys can kind of come together. And between the two of you, you have all three and you can have your business person that's going out, making those network connections. And yeah. I can be at home 
doing the programming, doing the building. And so we're both kind of doing the things that we love to do, but we're leveraging each, other, each other's skills to do it. And you know, Matt, that, that's, that's a really good point. Um, it is very viable to go and find a co-founder that complements your skill set, because honestly, it's pretty rare for any of us to have all of the skills right. to be a successful business person, right, a successful right. engineer, a successful entrepreneur, a successful salesperson. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah, um, yeah, so absolutely. finding a co-founder can be a really, really good idea. Um, but the, the passion is still very important because you have to convince the co-founder. Mm, you have to be able to at least sell your idea to another person to get them on board with joining you in on it. Right. But very good approach, very good way of doing it too. Great. So, well, well, while we have you paused <laughs> and, uh, and, and on, the, on a roll with questions here, um, we've got another question for you. Great. Uh, Jared actually wants to know, he, he, he says, I'm going to kind of scroll back and read this. Um, he's got a uh, he, he's got an idea for a product in the medical field, and he's not sure of the potential market. Should he patent the concept without any knowledge of the potential market, or what do you what would your recommendation be for that? Man, there's a lot of good <laughs> questions today. These guys are sharp. Yeah, um, they are. That that's a really good and um, actually a really really common question that people ask. Um, uh, again, there's no clear uh, black and white, exact right answer to this. Um, I guess what I would say is the reality is if you've got a product where you can't talk to anybody about it or test the market or test the customer base without disclosing your secret sauce, you're probably going to be in a precarious position anyway. Okay. Um, you should be able to keep your secret sauce buried um, enough that you can talk about your product in general terms or at least interview people yeah. and um, understand what it is that your customer base wants before you have to go and get a patent. Now, sure. if you can afford it, um, getting patents early and often is not a bad way to go, yeah. but it can certainly be a drain on resources. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, a provisional patent for a micro or small entity is only a few hundred dollars. Um, if you have trouble writing uh, a provisional patent on your own, an attorney for a provisional usually costs a few thousand dollars just to get started with that stuff. And a provisional patent gets you one year of, um, okay. uh, of space to work on your idea, to start talking about it, to start disclosing it, and to uh, learn what you need to learn. And when that one year is up, you have to file the real patent, oh, okay. which starts to cost a bit more on the right. order of, like, of $10,000 or more. I, yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. I've heard. Well, so hopefully that, hopefully that answers your question um, and, and helps you out a little bit. And even going back to kind of what you had mentioned earlier, it sounds like if Jared is in the position where he's already got that idea in his head for the product that he needs, mm -hmm. he's either maybe done some of that customer discovery already and doesn't realize it, or maybe that customer discovery at the more general sense is something that needs to be done and you're not really exposing your secret sauce because if you're still at that customer discovery point, you shouldn't really have a super clear idea of the final product yet, because I and know that, that that's can be. That's exactly right. Um, but here's the reality, though. Engineers like coming up with ideas. <laughs> Technical people like coming up with ideas. We all do. And we usually run down the road with a problem in our head that we've experienced or that we've seen someone close to us experience, and we run towards a solution. It's actually pretty rare that people have taken advantage of the opportunity to really do customer discovery. And I don't mean to be placing judgment on you, Jared, but um, statistically, it's pretty likely that the customer discovery hasn't been done in great depth. So it's yeah. a great opportunity to dig into it. Yeah. And, and additionally, um, Greg just mentioned NDAs as well, which I feel yeah. like are a very um, good way to navigate that if you don't have money for hiring a provisional or to get a provisional patent filed and things like that. Is that a good way to navigate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, NDAs can be great, uh, especially with industrial customers. If you're dealing with, with consumers and you're trying to do interviews, it's kind of hard to walk up to someone and say, hey, can I ask you a few questions? And oh, by the way, could you sign this three-page NDA? <laughs> right. That can get a little bit tricky. But I do um, it all the time. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it can be a, a, a little bit tricky to do that. Yeah. And um, you, you just have to kind of figure out what makes sense for you. But yes, absolutely. NDAs are a way of protecting your intellectual property and discussing your product and your idea and your, your solution freely um, without needing to have the patent in place. It's absolutely a viable approach. Just the logistics of it can be kind of tricky depending on how you're doing interviews and how, who you're talking to. Sure. Great. Well, I think that that 
really takes us nicely into the next step of the process, which is I've done my customer discovery. I've kind of got this great idea. And I know it's a great idea because 150 people I've talked to have all told Your me Your idea is terrific, Matt. It's Everyone's so terrific. gonna buy it, but now what do we do next? What do we do next? I don't know, Patrick, what is the next step? <laughs> Well, the next step is to really define what it is that you think you're going to create. Um, we often formulate this very clear idea in our own heads mm -hmm. of what it is that we want to build, but have a terrible time actually articulating it to other people, especially to engineers or design firms that we'd like to design and make our product. And so how do we get around that? We create requirements. We commit to paper okay. exactly what it is that we want to create, yeah. what it needs to do, and how it needs to do it, and just really define um, what it is that we're trying to do. Okay, cool. So, taking this back to my IoT, or I don't know if it's IoT yet, but taking this back to my plant sensor. Yeah, your plant sensor. Um, I'm probably going to be trying to come up with things like how much water does it need to sense or how often does it need to sense it or even what's it going to look like or things like that And how long do the batteries last? How long do the batteries last? Absolutely. Is it going to be this big or is it going to be this big? Okay, okay, cool. And I think this is kind of a good quick plug to make. We have some resources I think for people on the, along the lines of project requirements and things like that, don't we? That's right. In fact, um, we run into so many entrepreneurs and even large companies that, that struggle with the process of creating requirements. We actually created some, some white papers um, teaching people how to think about requirements, how to create requirements, and even a couple example products um, to give people some guidance. So you can actually find that um, on, our, on our website. I believe the live stream has a link yeah. that will go to our website. You can just uh, put, in, put in your email. Um, we'll put you on our newsletter, but we're not gonna spam you or anything. <laughs> and um, you can download that documentation, read it, and people are always actually welcome to reach out to me personally oh, awesome. um, for advice or additional information. Um, if they're they're trying to work through some product development. Great, great, and yeah, we'll add that in the description to the live stream as well, so you guys can check that out after the fact um, as well. Looks like we've got a question in the booth. Hey, yeah, so we do have a question actually from our email. Um, so, Dr. Patrick, you're a pretty knowledgeable guy, and Thank one you. of the questions was, <laughs> Dr. How do, Patrick, Dr. <laughs> Patrick, Don't let go Dr. To your Dr. Head, Marcus, Patrick. you know, whatever you prefer to go Swild by. Wild head. <laughs> <laughs> but the question was, how do we find a mentor uh, that can kind of guide us through this uh, uh, prototype to mass okay. production uh, type roadmap that we might have? You know, that's a, that's a really good question, and it depends heavily upon the community that you live in. Um, so I can certainly speak to, to Phoenix and Tucson. Um, Tucson has, has a hackerspace called ZeroCraft. They've got an entrepreneurial ecosystem called Startup Tucson. Um, Phoenix has quite a few as well. They've got heat sink labs. Oh, yeah. But um, every community these days has some kind of startup ecosystem. They have hacker spaces and maker spaces. They have engineers that hang out at those and entrepreneurs that hang out at those that are actually just looking to help people out. Um, there are people who have had entrepreneurial success um, multiple times and they want to pay it forward yeah. and pay people back for all the advantages they've gotten. So um, really the, the, the thing to do is to look for entrepreneurial support in your own local community. Okay. Um, there are plenty of mentors at the hacker spaces, sometimes at the universities and in these incubator programs as well. Yeah. Are there any online mentorship type things that you can connect with if you're, say you're in a really small town or something and entrepreneurship's just really not that big of a idea there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm actually not sure off the top of my head. I'm sure those resources exist and there are um, a handful of of remote programs, remote education programs, but honestly, I think a lot of those programs are pretty localized to local economies because okay. everyone's trying to find ways to create new businesses sure. and new technologies to create jobs. Sure. Everybody wants economic development. So I, I think the local approach is usually um, gonna be very viable, um, even though there may be a lot of online resources. Um, one example of an online resource that I can think of that isn't necessarily a mentorship resource, but it's a learning resource, is um, Lean Startup and Lean Launchpad. And okay. Those are methodologies for doing customer discovery, um, figuring out what it is that your business is trying to do, and iterating on those, on those early aspects of your business. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think I remember studying that a little bit in college, yeah, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. I remember reading that book. It was definitely a good one. Um, great. Any other questions? Uh, so, 
Let's see. We we have a couple actually. I, I think we'll we kind of have to parse through them a little bit. <laughs> you, you didn't catch us off guard, off guard at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, completely under control back here. <laughs> but well, Matt, why don't we work on yeah. work forward, talking a little bit more about requirements while they're queuing up some questions? Sure. So I guess the next question is, what are like common common gotchas or common things that people run into when they're trying to define product requirements that I may not, as a, as a noob to the field, shall we say, I may not realize our problems and then yeah, suddenly I'm yeah. gonna wake up one day and realize, oh my gosh, I've done everything wrong. Yeah, there's actually, there's actually quite a few gotchas that uh, people can pretty easily avoid, so it's, it's good to be talking about them. Um, one is um, not being detailed enough about what it is that you want mm, your okay. product to do. Yeah. Um, very often people will talk about their product in very vague terms and you need to get pretty specific. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to know everything about technology and about engineering to write product requirements. It's really about your grand vision of what the product is going to do. Okay. But you need to be specific about those things. So let, let me give you a couple examples. So. Um, you don't need to create a product requirement saying you will use this microchip microprocessor. Okay. That's a specification. That's telling me how I'm going to solve your problem. Okay. Okay. You don't want to do that. You want to tell me what you need the product to, to do. Not oh, the okay. how, but the what. Gotcha. So you want to say um, this product uh, needs to have needs to have batteries. Great, needs to have batteries. It should be less than three square three inches on each side, okay. you know, because this is going to be something that, let's assume that it's going to go into a pot. You don't want something that's a foot long right. to stick into a plant pot, right. so you need right. to define some mechanical requirements and say it should be three inches on a side sure. at most. Sure. Um, it's going to go in a, in a pot that you're watering plants. It should be waterproof. Oh yeah, You need to indicate that it's going to be waterproof. That's a good one. Um, we, we talked about it being battery powered. How long do the batteries need to last? No one's going to want something in their, in their potted plant that they have to change AA batteries every day. Great. Maybe it should be yeah. rechargeable, maybe they should be replaceable. But this is all part of really understanding what your customers need okay. and then turning that into what the product needs to do. And then mm. um, if you're the engineer or you're going to hire an engineering firm, um, then you take those requirements and turn that into specifications. Well, um, they want batteries, it needs this much power, so we're going to use AA batteries because those are going to be sufficient. Yeah. And we can use one of Microchip's super cool XLP processors that are really, really low power so that it'll last six months instead of one month if they were using something from one of the other guys. Yeah. Um, so th things like that end up becoming the specifications. But the most important thing for the entrepreneur um, is to be really thoughtful about the requirements for quite a few reasons. Okay, uh, looks like we got a question in the booth. Yeah, we finally have our act together. <laughs> yes, we do have a question. So uh, one of the questions from our email was, how do uh, small companies get that initial investment that they might need to uh, get started down this pathway? And that's also something that's been echoed in the comments as well. How do, how do people get funded? Right. Oh, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. <laughs> Um, you know, that, that's really something that, that almost every uh, early stage entrepreneur is asking about. Um, there's, there's a few ways to do it, and they all require that you either put in a lot of work, a lot of sweat equity up front to build the value of your company, or you have to bootstrap it. Okay. And by bootstrap, I mean um, uh, putting in your own money, yeah. um, um, working, working during the day and working on your product. Okay. and your customer discovery at night, or getting people to volunteer their time or to work for you for equity. Uh, it's very hard to be at a very early stage of entrepreneurship and go to someone and say, hey, give me some money, loan me some money, um, invest in my company. Yeah. You usually have to get to a business plan, be well through your customer discovery, have your requirements pretty well defined, and kind of understand what it is that you're going to do. Um, ideally, at least have a working prototype. Okay. Uh, investors really like it if you've got oh, a functional great. prototype, but uh, sometimes you can get away with just having a well-defined market, um, have a lot of customers having already indicated that they're interested in the product and if it existed they would buy it. Okay. In the consumer space if you could have a store or a distributor that's already said if you have this product I'm gonna buy a thousand of them day one. Oh, that'd be um, uh, great. <laughs> like a letter of intent kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but again those things are hard to come by but the reality is if you've really got an, a good idea and it's really viable and people really want it 
uh, that money is actually going to be not that hard to get, and um, the need and the demand of the market are actually going to kind of pull you forward okay. um, instead of you having to try to convince people that you've got a good idea. Sure, sure. And I, I think you brought up a really cool point there with that prototyping and having this, this thing that I can draw on the table. I mean, it kind of reminds me of the story. I think it was um, Square Cash, that thing that you can put into, yeah, exactly. put into a phone where they... Uh, they brought it and they had this initial idea and it was great and it was going to change everything and he brought it to a room full of investors and they kind of just laughed him out of the room. Yeah. So he left, went home, essentially created a little square cash prototype and took 10 million from one of the angel investors on the spot in their interview and suddenly he had all the cash invested that he ever needed. <laughs> um, and so definitely having the proof of the idea and I guess kind of that's where maybe the next step is when you go from your product requirements is as you're kind of still trying to define those and bring them down to a level where they're as general as they need to be, but as specific as they can be. Yeah. Um, prototyping, I would assume, plays a pretty a pretty important role within that process. Yeah, it, it does. And what people also need to realize is that when we talk about entrepreneurship and we talk about um, businesses and business plans, uh, we, we think about it as a very linear process. You yeah. go and you do your customer discovery, you recreate your requirements, you create your prototypes, you get more investment, you go to manufacturing and you sell your product. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't really work right that, like that. It's actually very iterative. You do some customer discovery, you try a functional prototype, yeah. you show it to some people, you ask some more questions, you do some more customer discovery. Maybe you get a little bit of money from, from yourself, um, may, maybe maybe you go into your girlfriend's purse and take take her credit card. Um, we would not may advocate. Maybe, that. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe maybe you, you get your your rich uncle or your parents to there to pitch go. in on it. Yeah. Um, often you have to start with your own money and the the three F's: friends, family, and fools um, <laughs> for your for your initial investment. And that usually gets people started with that first fifty or hundred k of yeah. money to get things going. But you iterate, you iterate through customer discovery, through requirements through prototyping, you find out what works, you find out what doesn't work. Yeah. And honestly, today, there is no excuse not to do prototyping, at least initially on your own. Yeah. The accessibility of, of Arduino, um, which, which the, the guts of are, are microchip components, yep. um, the curiosity boards that microchip has, that awesome little AVR board that is gonna be a prize after today's live stream, which, um, can I get one of those actually? Absolutely. I actually would love to have Absolutely. one of those things. We'll I've actually couple. got a couple of ideas I'd like to work on with Great. it. Um, Great. But uh, prototyping IoT products with um, the support of company like, companies like microchip and everything is so easy and so accessible yeah. today. There's lots of information on the internet. Uh, you can find people that will help you either in the maker community or through some of these corporations. Uh, it's a really good idea to at least get started um, with some of those prototyping tools. Uh, it can save you some money and it can help hone the direction that you need to go so that you can communicate with your engineers what it is that actually needs to be done. Great. And to that point of getting started in prototyping and things like that, um, if you guys are in the Phoenix area today. Um, actually, this evening at 7 p.m., we'll be doing a class at Heat Sink Labs. Heat oh, really? Heat Sink Labs. Heat talking sink. about um, c Talking about some of our tools and things like that. So you're in Phoenix, you're in Tucson, Yuma, Flag, come on down, warm up a little bit. <laughs> if you're in Yuma, you probably have to start driving now. No, yeah, but, that's true. But seriously, though, um, Heat Sink Labs is a great resource. Uh, Zerocraft in Tucson is a great resource. Yeah, and and almost every um, even smallest type city these days has some kind of hacker community and hacker space and it's really really um, nice to be able to take advantage of those. You, you'll be surprised at how friendly everyone is and how eager they are to just give you ideas and help you get on the right track. Absolutely. Yeah, so we'll be at Heat Sync Labs at 7 p.m. tonight if you guys want to come by. Definitely gonna have a lot of cool demos and things to show off tonight. Um, but I know we're kind of getting somewhat close to the end so you have a specialty. You run an engineering design house. That's right. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, so maybe going back to that idea, passion, um, what, were, what were the three? Passion. Passion. Talent. Talent. And network. Right. Passion, talent, and network. So maybe I have the passion, maybe yeah. I kind of have the network, but I don't necessarily have the skill set to really take my idea that I have. Or maybe there's other reasons why I would use a design house. So why would somebody come to you and present their idea to you and be like, please help? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of reasons uh, customers come and work with us because 
Uh, we've obviously got a lot of expertise across a broad range of electronics ranging from sensing systems to low power to IoT to power electronics to laser systems to medical devices. You do it um, all. So we, we, do, we do quite a bit of stuff. But uh, the reason that an entrepreneur generally comes to us is because they don't have that engineering skill set. They don't okay. know how to, how to manage an engineering project. And even if they are engineers and they're pretty good at prototyping, they may not know how to carry it all the way through to manufacturing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of documentation processes, regulatory concerns like UL or CE Mark or FCC okay. that need to be taken into consideration oh, yeah. depending on what kind of product it is. And there are actually some really good ways that that entrepreneurs can um, uh, protect themselves. Okay. Because unfortunately out there, not everyone's a nice guy and some people are out there just trying to grub for your money, like us. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, it, ca it can be kind of tricky. So that there, there's some tips I usually try to teach entrepreneurs to make sure that whether they're using an engineer or a lawyer or a software developer that they're putting themselves in good shape. You okay. want to hear what those are? I would love to. Would you like to? I would love to. Would right you like now. to know our secrets? Okay. Oh, Tell wow. us all your secrets. <laughs> On the edge of my seat in here. Yes. Yeah, I, I bet you are. I bet you are. So, um, actually, the easy one is already told you. Requirements. Okay. So the the cool thing about requirements is what you once you put it on paper, guess how many times you have to explain it to a new person again? A lot of times, I would assume. If you've got good requirements, you don't have to explain it again. Oh, really? You would be yeah. wrong. Yeah. I was that, incorrect. <laughs> that, that you would be wrong, sir. The whole point of the requirements is so you can take the exact same explanation and the exact same thing and say, I want you to look at this, I want you to look at this, and I want you to look at this, and I want to see what you come back with. Okay. I want to know what your price is going to be, yeah. how long it's going to take, and here's a really important one what's hard about the project. Oh, that's right. If you're talking to an engineering firm or a software developer and they're like, oh, everything's easy, no problem, don't, don't even worry about it. Yeah. That's a red flag. Okay. There should be something about the project that is at least the hardest thing. Okay. Maybe they understand how to do everything, but there's something that's a little risky. Sure. There's sure. something that's a little bit hard. And if you've talked to enough different service providers, enough different engineering firms, there should be consistency yeah. among the good ones about what's hard, about what's challenging, okay. um, about how difficult it will be to complete the project. And the nice thing about bringing requirements to them is it makes sure that your story is consistent each time. Because oh, if you okay. if you tell me about your watering product, sure. and then then you tell you the, the tell the tell Wayne in the booth about your watering product, and then you tell some other people about the watering product, mm -hmm. you might start skipping things, you might start adding stuff, oh, forget stuff, um, and then yeah. the story's different for each person you told it to, and that makes it difficult for them to be consistent in their response. Sure. So sure. requirements are key. Um, um, getting lots of opinions, looking for what's difficult is key, and there's a few other things that you can do to protect yourself. Um, if you get into a contract with them, make sure that you have a couple of opportunities to escape if it doesn't start going well. Okay. Um, if it's not going well, you want to get out at $5,000, not at $30,000, yeah. or when all the money's gone and yeah. six months late. So um, set some milestones. Um, what are they going to have done after the first month? Mm -hmm. What are they going to have done after the first $5,000? Be really specific about that. Okay. Um, the other nice thing is, in addition to setting some milestones, um, how are they going to prove to you that they did what they said they're going to do? How are they going to demonstrate that what they created meets the requirements? Mm -hmm. And that's something called a verification or a validation test okay. or a validation test plan. And a lot yeah. of engineers will have heard of this, but um, entrepreneurs may not have. And uh, what, what it means is for every one of your requirements, yeah. you create another document that says, this is how I'm going to prove that that was accomplished that that and that that was met. met. Okay. And um, if the requirements are well written and are very specific, mm -hmm. it should be very, very easy to create that one-to-one -one relationship between this is what it needs to do, this is what, how we prove it. It needs to be three inches on each side. We're going to measure that with a ruler and we're okay. going to write it down on a piece of paper. Gotcha. The batteries need to last for six months where we're gonna run, run it for six months and test it out and see if it works. Sure. The wireless needs to have a range of 100 feet. Well, we're gonna take our cell phone 100 feet away and see if it still works. Gotcha. So there, there should be a basic test for everything. And if there isn't a good test for the requirement, then the requirement might actually be too ambiguous. Oh, that's a really good kind of double check for your requirements. Like as a, well, a requirement then. like that would be like it should be pretty. <laughs> well, how, I know exactly how, how what pretty means. Well, so. yeah, you know what pretty means, but you might like the color pink, but I'm into purple. I can so tell when I get from the so shirt. yeah exactly so so um, 
you know, you, you give me you give me a pink box and I'll be like, this isn't purple. You didn't do what I wanted. Right. So I need to specify purple as opposed yeah, to pretty. Yeah. So you need to make sure that your your requirements aren't ambiguous and that they aren't subjective. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, looks like we have a few questions. Awesome. I know we're, we're starting to wrap up here. So what are the... Uh, Oh, wait a what do you got for us? You're wrapping man. up. We're having fun right yeah. now. Yeah, I'm Keep having a lot of fun. <laughs> I'll be here all week, guys. I was about to say we'll have to get Patrick out here again because I think we've 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 barely scratched the surface of what we're talking. Oh, there's about. so much fun stuff to I talk about, so. guys. So so uh, yeah, go ahead, Ricky. Yeah. So um, after developing my first prototype, should I take that all the way to mass production, or is there a step in between those two um, steps that I've done yeah, so far? That's a very good question. Yeah, that, that, that is a good question. Um, so what do you think the answer is, Matt? Well, I would assume that if I have an initial prototype, there's probably a few steps between my initial prototype and taking it to mass production. One of the like, really basic being, if I'm prototyping on a Curiosity Nano or even something as small as the AVR IoT board, mm -hmm. it's still probably going to have too many components and be too large to really be a cost-effective solution to manufacture on the spot. Um, and so there's probably going to need to be a few iterations. But once I've gotten that prototype within my total product requirement list, and I've designed it, and I've met all my product requirements, I would say that that's probably a pretty decent time that you know you're ready to take it and start talking to manufacturers. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a, a, a pretty good answer. And um, like with everything. I've been listening. Like, I've been listening. <laughs> um, like with everything, it depends. It really depends. If you're doing low volume manufacturing, um, for a mining company or an industrial application, you may be just fine with putting a curiosity board inside of a box okay. and, and, and selling that. And that can work very well. Um, all of the microchip demos are available for a long period of time. Yeah. And uh, they're perfectly suitable for that low volume kind of work. They're robust. They, they don't break or fail really. So that, that's not a bad way to go. Mm -hmm. But if you are more cost sensitive or you're looking at doing thousands of units or tens of thousands of okay. units or hundreds of thousands of units in a consumer space, um, you usually have quite a few. And I can't really put a number on it, but you usually have quite a few iterations mm -hmm. between prototype and manufacturing. Okay. And you usually end up, again, being a bit more iterative and doing a prototype, making a few hundred of them, getting mm. them out to customers. Yeah. And then you come back and you try to set up something for manufacturing. You make some changes based on your contract manufacturer's requirements. Okay, so they're and, gonna have their own um, set of requirements. There might be some components that are hard to get a hold of, so you might have to make some changes there. Yeah. And then maybe you do a run of 1,000 and get those out to customers and get them the feedback. Okay. And then you ramp up to 10,000. And then you start moving overseas and doing 100,000 mm. units. And at each step, you might need to make some changes. Yeah. But it really depends upon the particular situation that you're in, your particular market, your customer base, the cost sensitivity, the robustness of the product, um, and whether it can really all come together with those early prototypes or whether you need to do more work. But in general, it's more common that getting to a functional prototype is 25 to 50% of the way there. Okay. And there's quite a bit more to do for design for manufacturing um, to actually be at manufacturing and just turn the crank and make money. Right, and I would assume that even working with a design house or picking the right mentors or things like that are gonna help me with that as well. You really wanna have somebody on your team that's got at least some experience with working with contract manufacturers. Absolutely, and absolutely. Like that. And that's part of picking your design firm. Some design firms are good at low volume, some design firms are good at medical, some design firms are good at consumer and very high volume stuff. Okay. And those are some of the questions you want to ask and part of the reason for giving them requirements because that can help ferret out what they're good at, what they're not good oh, at. Oh, yeah. For absolutely. instance, a design firm say, oh man, this needs to be manufactured in China, it can only cost 50 cents, that's hard. Another design firm may say, oh yeah, we've got three guys working at our factory in China. No problem. Okay. And that's a good thing to learn about. Yeah, absolutely. I bet that would definitely help you decide, even if you have several design houses that look good on paper, one's always going to kind of have those specialties that align well with what your particular product yeah, is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Well, do we have any other questions in the booth? Well, let's see. I, I think we're... What do you say, what do you, what do you say Ricky? I yeah, think we're I think we're uh, about done in here as yeah. far as questions go. Great. Well, do we have uh, some... Giveaway winners, then? We've decided to not give away any boards. Yes. Well, I guess that's a wrap then. We'll <laughs> call it a live stream. No, uh, <laughs> so we actually do have a few winners. Uh, first of all, Jared, uh, Cat Cat Electronics, Cat 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 Electronics, I'm sorry, Greg, Ronnie, Wilson, 
Geraldo. Patrick Marcus. Um, Patrick Marcus. Yeah, Patrick Marcus. Yes. You get one as well. We're uh, paying you an AVR. <laughs> <laughs> Jotin, Easy Electronics, Manuel, and A. Steven. I wasn't sure how to pronounce your first name, so uh, I don't even want to try to I'm, uh, for fear of ruining Mispronouncing it. Mispronouncing your name? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so if you could... Actually, I'm not completely sure how. Oh, wait a minute. So, so basically what you have to do is send an email to livestream at microchip.com. And I think that uh, Clifford over there to your left will probably throw a uh, little tile on the bottom there that gives you the details. <laughs> send an email. Send all of your details. Uh, all basically of your, your, a okay, your address, <laughs> your shipping address, and a phone number. Um, we cannot guarantee, yes, we'd love to ship everybody aboard. We cannot guarantee that the, the customs agents in your country will allow us to do it. So as long as uh, we're good from a legal standpoint, we will ship you the board we'll, and we'll get in touch with you about that. But please send us, in that, send us that email to get the process started and we'll handle it from there. Wayne Freeman, wealth of knowledge. I don't know about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but most handsome man in the booth. There oh. You go. <laughs> Wow, crickets. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, um, yeah, I think that's all we have in the booth. Is there anything else? Uh, I think that's good. I'd like to thank everybody for the comments. I, you know, you guys on the stage can't see um, what everybody's posting, but the the the, comp, the chat has been fantastic. Definitely. Um, you've had people that that's have been chiming in to answer some of the questions. Um, we, we're, we're sorry, sorry we weren't able to get to all of the questions. We'll try and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try and kind of follow back up with, with those of you we haven't been able to do so with um, live stream at microchip.com. Any question you, you'd like to ask us, you know, we, we can try and get you taken care of there. Also, uh, Patrick, you want to give another plug for your uh you absolutely absolutely hey everyone thank you so much for checking us out on the live stream this was a ton of fun being here with with matt and the, the, the guys in the booth this is the microchips a great partner to work with so i recommend that everybody check out their development tools um they, they've got some great easily accessible stuff and of course the arduino platform is based upon microchip parts sure and um for those of you who enjoyed what we talked about today please come and check out uh, marcus engineering's website the the link to our white papers will be on the live stream that you can check out. We'll put it uh, in just, the description. Yeah, just just sign up. Just sign up with your email, and you can download all of those white papers. And then please reach out to me if you need any extra help or have any questions about the content. Thanks a lot, everyone. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we do this because it serves you guys. So we're so glad when people come out and they're commenting and they're staying active. We love it. Um, if you guys want to get Patrick Marcus back, it sounds like he's got a lot more to share. So give us a thumbs Everyone up. Everyone just clap. Everyone at home clap. <laughs> if it gets past the six on the audio meter, then they'll have me back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly um, how it's going. But for sure, <laughs> give us, for sure, give us a like. Uh, make sure that you're subscribing if you haven't already. We do lots of cool stuff. Sometimes we bring in great guest partners. Sometimes we go into really technical depth on a particular concept. So we've got a lot of really cool stuff uh, in the pipeline moving forward. So the next live stream, we'll actually be talking about security. So what does it mean to secure your microcontroller? And how do you do that in a really effective way? that makes sure that people aren't hacking into your system. There's been a lot of stuff in the news recently, um, and that's been a huge problem for some people. So definitely want to come check that out. Yeah, that one uh, sounds great. I'm going to have some of my employees watch that one. Do it. Yeah, do definitely. It. Um, and we'll hopefully bring Patrick back, because it's been a blast talking to you. So everyone at home, have a good day, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, all.